and your eminence, if you will op open, uh, welcome us and, and uh, bless us with an opening prayer. Thank you, Steve. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, in these first days of the holy season of Great Land, we ask you to forgive our sins, especially those we commit against the virtue of love. Forgive us for being many times envious instead of rejoicing in the good fortune that you have given us abundantly in our lives. Pardon us for being so quick to condemn and sentence other people. Forgive us for being sometimes cynical and small-minded and always justify ourselves by elevating our positions. This evening we ask you to bless us for by sharing the gifts that you have given us, we also know that we will become ambassadors of your gospel and can help bring others to the fullness of the faith. Show us what it means to live, to serve, and to give, so that we may find a place with all your saints at the celebration of your Paschal mystery. For you alone deserve all glory, honor, and worship together with the eternal Father and your all holy, good, and life-giving spirit now and forever and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Many thanks. Thank you, sir. Many thanks to Steve Pappas, to Christian uh, Bruskas, and of course, to our dear friend Bill Marianis, and to all of you, my beloved brothers and sisters in the Lord, for taking time, and also to Father James Cordaris, the loner from all the way the Long Island. It's so, it's so lovely to see your beloved face, my friend. The gathering that we have this evening, we call it a forum. I would call it a discussion about the message that Christ has bring, brought to us. And we are eager to make that message even more alive in our lives. Each of our parishes has a unique personality. We are blessed to share the common thread, which is the Orthodox faith and believe in Jesus Christ. And it's because of that, that we have the opportunity to see each other tonight and to hear the experiences. It reminds me of a recently discovered by the 21st century scientist, scientists a new uh, therapy for uh, PTSD. Many of you know what PTSD is, post-traumatic stress disorder. And they call it IDMR. It's an eye movement therapy that was first practiced 3,000 years ago by those Athenians who were putting up the theater, and they had engaged the audience on a constant basis for two hours with the actors and the actresses. So we are engaged in this time for the glory of God in this particular way of bringing the message of Christ. The engagement, it is the Christian stewardship. I just uh, finished a, com a committee meeting with one of, my, uh, of our churches and they have this uh, understanding of Christian stewardship like you go and knock the door of the big man, money man and tell him give me the money so I can build up the, 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 the house of God. And I was trying to tell them that this is not the way it goes. You have to do something different. This is what we're doing here today, something different. Learning how to do the stewardship campaigning, not because we want the money, 
and that has been said and stated by Bill Marianis many times. Stewardship is also about making the connections, like the, those old actors and actresses but 3,000 years ago were making it with his orient, their orients. They got them engaged, involved in the characters that they were playing. We don't play characters here, we have Christ, the real thing. But he wants us engaged as well. And this is what this is all about that we are gathered together. In what level the engagement becomes that therapy that we need for our soul at this time in our lives, in the lives of our families, in the lives of our communities, in the lives of our church. Financial advisors often say that in order to plan properly for your future, that you must pay yourself first each month. So they say meaning that as soon as you get paid, you should take a certain amount of money off the top and put it in a savings or investment account. We can learn from this example, and the one that I said about the actors and actresses, if instead we give back to God our first fruits, giving our very best gift to him, engaging us as stewards in his kingdom. I am certain that our stewardship mentor, Bill Marianis, will guide us in this process during this presentation this evening, my beloved brothers and sisters in the Lord. Bill, even with your beard that you look so, so, so impressive, once again, we're grateful for your generosity of time and for staying up late for those of us on the West Coast and sharing your inspiration with us. Thank you all, and may God bless us all, and may God bless you. Thank you, Your Eminence. Bill, can get us started tonight. Uh, let's, no, let's, no introduction necessary. Nah. I'm very familiar with Mr. Marianas, but Brother Bill, if uh, you can inspire us as you always do, and uh, again, encourage everyone, let's get into some good dialogue, as His Eminence had uh, had uh, had had suggested and uh, certainly something we want to be doing so bill thank you steve thank you Kristen, and, and and most importantly thank you your eminence a for your inspirational beginning I, I really love the metaphor that you chose in there and and we're going to use it and i think the financial advisor advice that you were talking about was solid advice those of you that have participated in the full stewardship program that we did remember the conversation about the 10 10 80 rule where you take the first 10 percent of everything you make and you give it to God's kingdom. You do something with it in the church or some charitable work. The second 10% is what you put aside for your savings and retirement, and then you learn to live off the 80%. So it's good advice. So tonight we're gonna actually drill down into something that's very, very critical. And we're gonna talk about successful stewardship campaigns and some of the best practices associated with that. And hopefully that's what's on your screens and what you'll see uh, during the course of the presentation. Uh, this entire deck has now been uploaded uh, onto my website, stewardshipcalling.com, that you can access under the stewardship tab. And you just scroll down to the Metropolis of San Francisco program, and you can find it there. It will also be available on the Metropolis of San Francisco stewardship websites. So regardless of how you go, we're going to bookend you with the content and information from tonight's presentation, and it will be available to you for free forever. Now, one of the things that is so important that we that we begin this with is to understand, based on the words that His Eminence reminded us so pro properly, that the most comprehensive solution for most of your parish challenges is engagement. In fact, as you remember from the materials that we covered in the in this in the five part program, was that engagement is directly related to the level in which people choose to contribute their most valuable asset, their time and their talents, and then their second or third or fourth most valuable asset, their treasures. And so let's not forget that what the exercise of everything we have to do is being focused on the goal of engaging our parishioners. Of course, first liturgically and sacramentally, also in the ministries, and then also in the support. Uh, the book that I referenced before, and I recommend that every parish council leader read, is uh, Al Winsman's book, Growing an Engaged Church. But I just want to focus 
on two of the quotes from this book. This is comes from over 70 years of research that the Gallup organization has done. And two of the quotes that he said, those who are engaged, and there's a wide definition of what that means in their book. It's not just the, the ministry activities. It's the fullness of their engagement in the church. Give more to their congregations than anyone else does. And indeed, the data from the Gallup organization shows that the most engaged members will give a median of 5% of their annual income to the church. So when people say to me, gee, what can we do to get people's greater risk uh, uh, rewards from their financial contributions, my answer is always the same. Engage them in the service of the church and service to the church in the services of the church. And when we get people engaged, trust me, the money always follows. Now, I know that as I begin this program to talk to you about the techniques of a stewardship campaign, you feel like the uh, congregation in this preacher's church here when he says, I'm going to begin a 10-part series on stewardship. But I'm going to flip the script on you a little bit. When I was first talking to uh, uh, somebody a while back about their stewardship campaign, a, uh, a wise clergyman just kind of rolled his head back and forth. And I said, what's the matter, Father? And he said, every time I think about when you start talking about a stewardship campaign, I think about a battle, that we're just going to have a battle in front of us. And I thought, what a beautiful metaphor. Let's use this battle metaphor. And, and let's talk about how our, some of our people proved that the battle metaphor is a good metaphor to win any kind of campaign. So when you think about what do you need to win a battle, some of you, your minds will be, would we be brought to that great famous historical figure, the Trojan horse. And if you think about the Trojan horse, you, you know, you learn, you learn a lot of different lessons, but if you really step back up to 50,000 feet and think about the insights that these people adopted when they decided to, to go about this thing of a Trojan horse, that, that there was a really a lot of work that went into it well before they, they laid this out here. So let's explore how do we win the battle of a stewardship campaign? Well, as it turns out, there are a few established principles that if you will follow them, you can win the battle of a successful stewardship campaign. And here they are. You need to have a worthy vision supported by a committed team in pursuit of a winning strategy using proven tactics aided by persuasive communications that arise through the use of effective weapons along an achievable schedule with dedicated execution. And for those of you that are visual kinesthetic learners, we've got a graphical depiction of how we win this battle. And so this was for the benefit of the clergyman who first asked me the question about every time he thinks about get engaging the stewardship campaign, he thinks about it in a battle. So I was able to find this photograph. So let's take each of these elements of them and let's go through it in some rapid form because some of this we've already covered before and I'll allude to it. So let's begin with a worthy vision. Now you will never, ever, ever attend a program that I'm ever involved in, in which we will not confront the most important question that I always ask, and it's the why question. The reason why I'm the orthodox why guy, not wise guy, but why guy, is because I'm always asking the why question. And normally I'm asking in the context of you, why are you here? What are you called to do? What is your why? But let's focus now as we think about the stewardship campaign on what is your parish's why? Why does your parish exist? What is the fundamental reason for which your purpose, your parish exists? Why should anybody care? Why should anybody want to join your parish? And it's critically important that you know the answer to that question. What I have found in all the years now that I've been doing strategic planning, best blessed by the first program that we did for the metropolis of San Francisco, what I've discovered is in answering this question, we find the most cohesive truth that we can unify a parish around. It's the reason why now I start everything with a why discovery process. Indeed, one of your parishes shortly will be going through a why discovery process. Don't know whether they're going to go further than that, but we're going to really drill in and see if we can reach a fundamental understanding of the why of your parish. Now, you remember from the cover of the Metropolis of San Francisco strategic plan, the, the great words of scripture, Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no vision the people will perish. 
And it is the vision that unifies people in a common direction towards a common goal, regardless of how challenging it's going to be. Imagine for a second that you're one of the 12 apostles and the Lord's getting ready to leave and he tells you he's leaving you and he tells you he's going to be, to be dead and he's going to be crucified. He's going to be resurrected again. And he's leaving it in your hands and he gives you instructions. And his instructions to you is, I want you to take what I've taught you over these last three years and deliver it to the world. And you're thinking, wow, how are we going to do that? But he cast a vision for them about what he wanted them to do. And it is because they understood the vision, they could actually see the vision. That's why we call it a vision statement. You've got to be able to see it, right? That it, people were motivated, his apostles and eventually the disciples. So what lesson do we learn from this? And that is every campaign, every stewardship campaign, every year must begin with an understanding of the why of your parish. Why does your parish exist? And when you articulate that why, you will understand the truth behind the fact that people give to causes not to crying. They give to causes, not to crying. The why that you're doing it is what will motivate them. The fact that you have rain that waned out your festival or that you had a virus that kept your churches from being open or you had leaky parking lots or you know domes and stuff like that, that is uninspirational. That is non-motivational. They have to understand their why of the parish. And when you can shift their focus to the why of the parish, you will get a vastly different result from them when you ask them to participate and engage in the parish. Now, if you think about it, I've been doing this for you for the entire program that we do and every program I always do, because here's what I discovered. If I was thinking about what I was going to do every day of the life, every day of my life, I came up with one answer. But it was when I changed my focus, my vision, to focus on the why that it really changed my mind. And that's the reason why you'll know that every one of the programs that we did together, I began with the, 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 the quote from 2 Corinthians 5.10 that's in our divine liturgy, where we pray for a good account before the awesome judgment seat of Christ. And I asked you the question that I'm most afraid Christ will ask every one of us, what did you do with my church under your watch given all the gifts I give you. Now, why do I ask that question to people all the time? Because I want to shift their attention away from today and tomorrow and the problems and the rain and the potholes. And I want them to focus on their eternal salvation, the eternal reason why we, we have perpetual life in, in, in our Lord and Savior and the opportunity to use the church as a vehicle to gain that wonderful gift. So when we shift our focus away from the problems of the day and say, our job is to bring people closer to Christ so that they can spend all of eternity with him. Do you understand how that's a very different objective than if I told you your job is to raise enough money so that you can fund a budget or your job is to, to get enough volunteers so that you can make enough Yiddo sandwiches at the festival. We're, we're changing our focus. And that's why I say it's a critical to begin your stewardship campaign with a clear understanding of the why of your parish. Then you can start to give them paradigm shifting ideas. And that was, the, you'll remember from the, what I told the big life-changing idea that I, I've come up with, and it's called INIIG, which stands for it's not yours, it's God. When we, when we realized that in Matthew 10.8, what, what, what was taught there was the truth, nothing we have is ours. We are temporary caretakers. We are temporary stewards of that which is in our possession. It's ultimately, it's God's, God's grace, God's gifts, God's ability that he gave us that caused us to do this. So if we start to think about our what we have in front of us as just a, a, some assets and some time and some resources and some education and a network that we can use to work for God's greater glory, to bring people closer to Christ, and so that we too may one day have a good account before the awesome judgment seat of Christ. Do you understand how this shifts your focus from the mundane of a stewardship campaign to the lofty, aspirational, important Christian understanding of what it means to be a steward? So the first step in this process is to understand why does your church exist? Why are we conducting a stewardship campaign? And make sure that we are grounded in the right theology, and the right philosophy so that we can approach this holy work as sacred work and not just as the boring mundane work that has to happen every year. 
Now, the second part to achieve what we want to do is to really have a committed team. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the team information that we talked about before. But before I do that, we want to intersperse some of the presentation. So I'm going to turn this back over to Steve. And Steve is going to introduce one of your parishioners from one of the parishes that, that we've been blessed to work with, Steve and I and Kristen and the others in the metropolis, that have actually started to develop and utilize some of these concepts of building a team and building a campaign. Steve, take it away. Thank you very much, Bill. Um, I know that uh, we were going to uh, have uh, Margaret uh, present at the end, but uh, I know she won't be able to, to stay on the entire um, the time today, but wanted to have her share some of the great work underway at Holy Transfiguration up in Anchorage. Um, and uh, in particular, Margaret, as you've started to compile um, your team uh, for stewardship, um, we'd love to hear about Again, some of the great work you're doing up in Anchorage, and I know you're working with Bill. So, Margaret, if you can give us a few minutes of, of what's happening up at Holy Transfiguration. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that, Steve and Bill, and um, lovely to see you again, your intimates. You always inspire me. Just, just hearing you even give the opening remarks makes me want to go do more for my church. So, thank you. A um, couple of things, um, and what a great segue, Bill, because I had some notes here. And my first thing was that we came up with a vision statement and uh, we, and I'll talk about my team in just a second. Our vision statement is creating a culture of generosity and giving through the use of our time, talents, and treasures to grow the love of God in our hearts and our community. Um, Craig actually came up with that for the, for the most part and, and we ran with it. We liked it. We put it on cardstock and we put it out with our stewardship um, mailing, which we always um, start with the calendar and, you know, a letter. And then we did uh, one of the things that Bill talked about. We had, there's three of us on our team this year, uh, myself, Craig Baxter, who's um, in his forties with uh, two very young children. And then Savannah, who's in her twenties and single, but got a steady and looks like he's coming to church. Maybe they'll, you know, be a thing in the future. So we have this old person, me, and the medium person with the family, and then the young person, and we did three letters. We went through our entire mailing list, and we said, okay, that's Craig, that's Savannah, that's me, and we divvied up the list, and we did three letters. We got a pretty darn good response. Then we had Craig do the follow-up letter, and I am pleased as punch that we just did that a couple of weeks ago and got in eight more stewards, um, and then I kind of went around to some of our regular stewards who don't want to fill out the little, little card. And I'm like, gosh, you know, I'd really love to see you vote because, you know, you're a steward anyway. We might as well put you on the roster. And so I'm really pleased tomorrow I'm going to report at our parish council meeting that we have, um, I, I want to say, 50 stewards. Last year we had 44. I, I think we're close to 50, if not 50. And we have already pledged about 20% more than what was pledged last year. So um, one of the things that Craig did was also write in about the rounding up. Um, we have a goal that every month something goes out. So uh, this month was um, in addition to our follow-up in the mail, uh, we did an email of Savannah reporting what it's like to be a steward. And one of the reasons I picked her is she's, she's a tither. She comes from that that background. So she's not afraid to talk about her giving. And as a young single professional, it's, you know, it's pretty impressive. And, and so I'm, I'm super excited about that. And then my last comment has to do with um, a little thing that we did. We always have a holiday baklava fundraiser. And um, the last two years for our Greek festival, we have given 10% of our net proceeds to a local charity. One was Special Olympics and this year was a children's lunchbox. And there's always a little pushback on that, but there was a lot of pushback the other way. Well, we don't want to volunteer anymore if we're not going to give to the community and some comments of that nature. So it was easy to do this with our holiday baklava fundraiser um, ahead of time. We told everybody we're going to give 10% of those proceeds, the gross proceeds, to three youth organizations, our dance group, our Sunday school program, and our um, lawn maintenance crew, the kids who come and mow the lawn every week, they rotate in and out. And um, they picked Salvation Army, one of them, because they'd never heard of any other charity. 
and they got the standard, you know, thank you. And if you can give more, we'd really appreciate it. And then there was um, the youth, uh, excuse me, the dance group who gave to a really awesome organization called Alaska Child and Family that, that really is, is awesome and houses youth who are in trouble. And they wrote us a letter and they were like, we can't ever talk about God, but when we get something from a church, we can talk about God and we have a program and we're so excited. And it was really great. And I shared that with his eminence because I was just blown away by it. And then the third one was um, a arm of the Salvation Army. Uh, this was our Sunday school program, picked an arm of the Salvation Army called the McKinnell House that houses families who are without a home at the moment and especially women uh, and children. And they offered to give the Sunday school a tour as soon as this pandemic thing is over and they're gonna do a Sunday school um, event where they tour the place. So what we did then, and we are still doing, is every month putting out a comment or two. And I just wanna share one from a small child of the Sunday school. And this is a quote, it makes my heart feel big, unquote. So when those things go out, I think Bill is absolutely right. It inspires people. They see that we're in the community. They see that Holy Transfiguration now has a footprint in the community is not just, please come to our festival and help us, but we help others. So thank you for the time, Steve. I uh, um, appreciate it. And I, I'm super excited and thrilled. And, and our program is just rocking in large, in, in, full response to Bill's um, help. Margaret, that's absolutely fantastic. Uh, you know, a, a parish with now 50 steward families and all the, the activities and all the things you're doing to maintain and build the community um, up there in Anchorage. So I uh, really, truly appreciate Margaret, um, you sharing a bit of uh, your experiences and we're, look, we're looking forward to hearing more. I mean, this is, again, this is a, supposed to be, these town halls are supposed to be very dynamic and hopefully, you know, you'll share the other successes you, you come across and even the challenges, you know, this is a, a safe environment for all of us to share and to learn from um, given the, the responsibilities and roles we have. So thank you, Margaret. Um, have a wonderful time with your guests uh, this evening. Stick around as long as you can. Bill, if we can continue, we can. Um, but 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 before we go, can I can I ask Margaret a favor and then correct her on one thing? So here's the favor I want to ask her, Margaret. If you can take that document that that child mentioned, that incredible quote that that child mentioned, and make sure it gets into Steve's hands. Steve's got a video that he's putting together for the Metropolis, and it strikes me that that an image of that letter with that description on it would be very, very uh, impactful for other people to share. Uh, and the only correction I wanted to make is it the work that you did is not is not because of anything I did or Steve did or Kristen or even his eminence did. It's because the work that the Holy Spirit allowed you to do and your community to do, and you all stepped in and recognized the ability and the resources and the talents that you've been given and said, you know what, we can do more. And I, I want everyone else here to listen to the, the subtext of what Margaret said. Notice the intentionality by which she went about everything she did. Now, I'm not going to fess at her about doing the letters because I know they're on their way to do the visitations and she does she does a bit of the strong arm, but listen to the creativity evolved of what they did, first of all, and we're going to segue into this in a second, the team. Notice how she picked people of different demographic groups to be part of the team, but what you may have missed in what she said when she said that they wrote a letter, she's picking up on one of the tools that we talked about in the in program is that whenever you write a letter, don't write the same letter to every demographic, write a different letter to the demographics based on what's important to them. And how more credible are you going to be than when you get somebody who is a member of that demographic actually writing the story, right? So letters aren't going to oftentimes drive the behavior that a personal touch will will drive. But if you're going to do it at all, and you need to do it, of course, you need to write it. And then notice the other aspect of that is that then we're going to touch on this in just, you know, later on in, in the program of the campaign, that the the constant repetition reminder of monthly communicating about stewardship, and then sharing the the burden and the opportunity with everybody by getting the young woman to talk about her 
walk of faith. And then I'm sure that Margaret's going to get some of these kids who had an extraordinary experience to tell their stories and share their stories with people. And it is in the sharing of these stories that we can actually start to see the good that we're doing in the kingdom that that's beyond just the paying of the bills and the meeting of the budgets and the other kinds of things. This is what's going to inspire behavior. But it, what it takes is leadership like Margaret and her team willing to submit themselves to the Holy Spirit and then take advice and may take suggestions and try things out. And guess what? They're not all going to work. And as his eminence said, your parishes are all a little bit different. So what may work exceedingly well at one parish may need some tweaking to work in another parish. But if you just listen to what they're talking about, and, it, and there'll be another parish that we're going to be talking about with your parish shortly, that's going to be doing something really spectacular in terms of taking the good and faithful steward challenge and challenging the youth of the community to embrace an act of stewardship. I think you're going to start to see transformational activity. So Margaret, thank you very much. God bless you for everything that you do. Keep at it. And we look forward to the next time that you're called on a report that you're not just going to deal with a, you know, a, a, a paltry 15, 18% improvement in headcount of stewards and a 20% improvement of stewardship uh, that as you proceed down the good and faithful steward challenge and as you proceed down the rounding up process, we'll see a doubling and we'll see a doubling sooner rather than later. And I know that the, that the, the Holy Spirit's gonna be working with you. So thank you for sharing. Um, when we talk about the committed team, if you remember back to the presentation, um, we talked about having a committed, trained and enthusiastic stewardship team. And I know that when I first say that, in fact, every time I say that, everybody laughs at me because usually it's it's either the last person who was elected to the parish council or the person who's, you know, who, who missed a meeting, who gets appointed stewardship chair. But if you will embrace a group team with different and diverse skill sets and get them working on this consistently, you'll see amazing, amazing results. And I think Margaret gave us an example of how you can do that. I outlined 10 functions that the stewardship ministry has to be able to perform. Now, if you can get 10 people, that's great. But even if you don't get 10 people, if you get five or six people, somebody can do multiple roles. Somebody needs to chair the whole thing and get it, keep things moving. Then it works best if somebody is responsible for communications. We're going to talk about that. Somebody's responsible for welcoming. If you have a welcoming committee in your parish, then the head of your welcoming committee ought to be a part of your stewardship team. A thanking committee. You notice how important it was for Margaret to stress the thanking to the community because that's what reinforces the behavior we want. Um, if you're blessed to be able to start a small group ministry and not every parish is ready to do that, whoever's in charge of your small group ministry would be part of your ministry, your stewardship team. They'll be somebody who's responsible for the official campaign, that which we're talking about tonight. So more on that later. Uh, and then you should be having somebody focused on plan giving. You should have somebody focused on the youth stewardship component. We're going to talk about that tonight. You should have somebody focused on training people, what I call the ambassadors, the people that are going to talk with the other stewards and get them engaged in ministries. And then finally, somebody to crunch all those numbers and get that all together for you so that you can have the data that that that, that Margaret shared with us. And again, this whole presentation deck is available and you can download it from there. The third thing that we talk about in a stewardship campaign in winning the battle of stewardship is a winning strategy. Um, Luke 10, 14, 28, I think put it in as good a terms as you can. For which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it. The, the moral of this story is you don't just start running a campaign, you plan the campaign. And, and you, there are certain things that you need to do that you want to do in order to have the most effective campaign that, that what, that's planned out systematic fashion. And that's the reason why Steve and Kristen and his eminence wanted to have this program tonight. So you can understand a little bit more about what does a systematic program look like. Now, if, if instead of Holy Scripture, you prefer a, a different cat, kind of motivational factor, then I present to you a wonderful quote from Sun Tzu in The Art of War, keeping this battle theme, uh, when he said, strategy without tactics is the slowest route to victory, but tactics without strategy is the noise before defeat. What, what he's getting at is that you have to have a strategy of what you want to accomplish and then a series of tactics that will get you there. 
but you cannot just have tactics if you're just running around doing things which is quite frankly what most of our stewardship campaigns have looked like then we're making a lot of noise but we may not ultimately make a difference right if you just have a brilliant strategy but you don't execute it well that's great congratulations but you're not going to get there either it's that combination of effective strategy and effective tactics and one of the things that i realized along the way in this process is that all too often we use some really 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 bad strategies and tactics so on august 7th 2019 on my ancient faith radio live program i interviewed an orthodox priest he's a part of the antiochian jurisdiction in uh in, um Wichita, Kansas, by the name of Father Aaron Warwick, who, uh, when I finished his strategic plan for his parish, I encouraged him to, because uh, he really had a passion for this stuff, to, to go and pursue it further. And he went and got a master's degree. And his master's uh, thesis was on overcoming donor fatigue, something we talk a lot about. It is a phenomenal, phenomenal work product. I highly recommend you look at it. If you go to my website under the Ancient Faith Radio tab and scroll down to the August 7, 2019 date, you can actually download a copy of Father Warwick's uh, master's thesis that has all of the data and all the research in it that I highly recommend that you do. And if you need to, you can always shoot me an email at bill at stewardshipcalling.com and I'll send you a direct link. Um, but here are just a few of the key points that he talked about when we start to think about strategy and tactics and stewardship. Number one, it's important to communicate your key stewardship strategies. What are you trying to accomplish with what you want to do? In the context of uh, communicating to the church, we really want to talk about what is our why? Why are we doing what we're doing? The second thing is to focus on solutions instead of problems. We overemphasize the problems and the issues and the challenges we're facing as opposed to how we're going to address those. So if you, if you were to talk about the fact that you know, we have a, a pervading issue of homelessness in our communities, here's the strategy we're going to do. Number three, the lesson, and this is all backed by science. I'm giving you a Bill Marianas Cliffs Note version of a beautiful master's thesis with scientific data behind it. What they found is that when you talk about the proportion of people helped, it's more valuable than if you just talk about the numbers. Even if the numbers of people are, are the same, if it's a higher percentage, it's better. Let me give you an example. If we, if we take care of one kid, out of 10, that's 10%, right? If we take care of one kid out of two, that's 50%. We've still only helped one kid, but when we report 50%, in, people are inspired to think we're more effective. So you just need to think about the dynamics of how you communicate what you're trying to communicate in that the, the higher the percentage of impact you can have, the more effective it's going to be. One of the other tools is to stress similarities between victims and donors. Now, again, this is looking at all kinds of donations. It's not just a stewardship campaign. But if you think about it in the context of helping other people and helping other people, everybody can relate to the fact that there's times in their lives when they didn't feel particularly close to Christ, where they may not have felt close to the church, where they may have felt disengaged from the practices and the belief and the practices of the church. That's something they can relate to. And what we're trying to do is create a church in which that never happens. You can do the same thing with, with homelessness. People can remember the time that, you know, maybe they weren't homeless, but maybe they can remember the time when they were poor, when they were just starting out, when they didn't have as much and, and whatnot. So stressing similarities is also helpful. And then what they found is that if you can identify a single victim being helped, it's more impactful. I, I love the experiment that they did was they were doing a Save the Polar Bears campaign, right? They were raising money to save the polar bears. And they talked about if you contribute, you can save all these polar bears. But instead of talking about all the polar bears, they talked about, and I forget the the exact name i'm going to make this one up bobo the polar bear and they told the story of bobo the polar bear and how your dollar contributions can help bobo the polar bear and all of a sudden the level of generosity went up if you look at the really effective campaigns that you see on tv now they're personalizing it around a story of a human they're personalizing about a story that people can relate to and these are all ways that you help overcome donor fatigue and then one of the last points they make over and over again we're going to talk about is thanking and celebrating thanking and celebrating, thanking and celebrating. My brothers and sisters, you can never thank too much. Trust me, you will never, buddy, you can never hear everybody say, wait, stop thanking me for that, you know? And if you do, then you've probably gotten to the right level. So let's talk a little bit about some of the tactics. Now, this is where we gave you a very rich solution to the problem. 
of the stewardship campaign. We went in great detail in, I think it was episode two of the five part story of igniting the flame of stewardship for the metropolis of San Francisco, where we went in great detail about plan A and plan B. Under plan A, every steward is visited in their home by an ambassador. And in plan B, we have small group gatherings. Now I know we're still in the COVID period and yeah, I'll give you a little bit pass of a little bit longer now that, that you're really not able to do this, particularly those of you on the West Coast. See, we down here in the South, we're, we're wide open so we can do all kinds of things now. But, but I want you to start thinking about planning these campaigns going forward where the only way these things are gonna work is when they are personalized and when there's hand-to-hand -hand combat where they're really talking to people in a, in a righteous way. We gave you a nice nine step wholly engaged process, starting by building a consensus of your priest and parish council and stewardship ministry, adding to that clarity of the mission and the vision, and then the objectives you want to achieve. If you listen to what Margaret was talking about, the first thing they did was they created a vision for what their parish wanted to be. And if we had more time, we'd actually break apart that vision she talked about because there were four distinct elements of it that really drove behavior. Then they organized their ministries in a cohesive fashion. They created their handbooks and their materials. We're gonna talk about that in a second. And then steps five through nine, they went out and touch people and visit people and actually engage people in the ministries of the church. This is the unequivocally most effective tactics to achieve the best stewardship campaign. I will tell you, you can make some progress by writing better letters and better emails and making better telephone calls. You will never achieve the kind of breakthrough results you can achieve until you actually do this process. And this process is not a process that we just set up one night and created. It's a process that if you think about it, and if you actually trace the life of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, this is a very similar process to the way he built his ministry. And this is the church we're now celebrating almost 2000 years later, building a consensus among the team, creating clarity of the vision, organizing his apostles into different missions and different ministries, creating the materials. Now they didn't have handbooks and fancy emails back then, right? You know, but, but they clearly had the parchments that they could use and the homilies that they could deliver. And then they went out and did what? They went out and preached and they touched people and they engaged people in the church. So when we talk about tactics, these are the tactics. Now, a point on communications. Um, you may remember from if you if you participated in the stewardship program, the five-part program, and again, I'm not saying this to do anything else other than to tell you we went in great detail in some of these. I encourage you to go back. Kristen was kind enough to record all of those sessions. You can download the recordings of them on the Metropolis website. I also have links to it on my website, so you can actually go back and get the content. Here's one of the books that we talked a little bit about, Gerald Panis' book, Mega Gifts, where he's talking about the motivations of people to be donors. And it's causes with integrity and people with integrity. Causes with integrity and people with integrity, which, you know, I call it the CPI process, right? Now, again, this is a, a summation and a simplification of what is a really thoughtful piece of research that Gerald Panis did. And I do recommend you get the book. I, I recommend the second edition over the first edition because he updated it. Uh, what this leads to is three kind of behaviors, sharing the dream, sharing the team, and sharing the scheme. See, I like things to rhyme, you know? So, so when we talk about sharing the, the dream, let's talk about what we mean. It gets back to that fundamental point that we were talking about at the beginning. The messaging has to be around the cause, the why, the mission. What are we trying to accomplish? And then we have to relate this vision or this mission or this why to the stewards. This is why it's important to you. Now, some of you may have gotten motivated when I, when I referenced the, the 2 Corinthians 5.10 relationship to working towards your salvation and working towards that good account before the awesome judgment seat of Christ. In Margaret's instance, she can actually talk about how they work the explanation of the mission in terms of helping these three ministries that, that they chose to reach out to and they chose to make a difference in. And then relating the story to the people so that they can understand and impact it. And then the last message, and I couldn't have predicted this, but the last message there is one size fits all communication fits no one. And that's the reason why I highlighted what they did in Margaret's parish and in, in Anchorage by 
creating different messaging for the different groups of stewards based on what is important to them. Because as I always say, what's important to an 81 year old senior citizen is not the same thing that's important to an 18 year old single person. So don't think you can send one communication that's gonna resonate with all of them. You need to set demographically segregated communications focusing on the issues that are important to them. When we talk about the team, people give to people who mean something to them. People give to people who mean something to them. If I ask a favor of someone I know, the results are going to be much more significantly higher. And so when we know the science all shows us that it's personal, we talked about that a lot in the stewardship program, why would we start to do tactics that are less personal by sending just letters and sending emails and making telephone calls? Now a telephone call at least has the beginning era of personal because it's one-to-one -one com com uh, communication as opposed to just broad. But what you really wanna do is make this a personalized exercise. And the third part of what they talk about in this book and what's critical is that people will not give if they think you are irresponsible or poorly organized or poorly led. So it is important to be transparent and accountable in everything you do. It's the reason why I tell every parish, take your financial statements and put it up on your website. Take your audit, put it up on your website. Take your stewardship report, put it on your website. Talk about it, make it available to everybody. Show to the world of your community that you have nothing to hide and that you're proud of everything that you do in that regard. When you look at the science of generosity studies, and this is a group of studies that I talked about in the full program, I, I kind of tried to summarize on this slide here the 10 critical things that talk about the importance of communications and how you can have the most effective stewardship communications. They have to be positive, not negative. Don't talk about your problems. Don't talk about your challenges. Paint a beautiful picture of where you're going. You need to focus on the mission, the vision, the why, the life-changing ministries. When you can communicate to someone and saying, when you help us help others, this is what we do with it. This is how we change lives. This is how we bring uh, people closer to Christ. You need to share the abundance in your community, even in times of need, in times of challenges, even in communities that don't feel like they're necessarily blessed. As I shared with you before, I think the number is $34,000. If you make $34,000 a year or more, you're in the top 1% of income globally. Let that settle in on you a second. I, I know those of you in California saying $34,000 will be my Uber fare, but, but, but what I'm telling you is this is a level of the abundance to which we are blessed in this great country and your great metropolis to have. So talk about it in a positive way. Share that we are so blessed to do it. It's the reason why I've seen some amazing parishes do some great things during this during the time of the pandemic where they'd say, take your extra pair of shoes and drive by the church, don't stop in and drop them in the box. And we're going to take all of these shoes and we're going to give it to a homeless ministry where they need shoes for the homeless people. And then they got, were so successful, they did it with coats and then they did it with clothes and then they started doing it with food. And now it's an integral part of this church's regular stewardship ministry of serving and helping the community at large. And yes, it's helping the parishioners get rid of stuff in their closets that they don't need and want, but, but this is this is win-win time, right? So share the abundance, share stories of generosity, not, not bragging stories about look at what I did, look at, but share stories of other people. It's the reason why I'm so happy and Steve's so happy and Kristen's so happy and his eminence is so happy to tell your stories. We don't want you to hear stories from, from other places. We want to tell your stories. So share these stories of, of generosity. Communicate regularly, consistently. We're going to talk about that in a second. Second. Make sure that you have given them easy ways to give and then describe how easy it is to give. Two clicks and that's it. Swipe your card here, whatever it is, make it easy for them. Discuss your culture of generosity. In other words, create the, the, the mindset in our community is we are a generous parish. Now, maybe your level of financial giving isn't what it should be or what it could be, but, but if you create this notion of we, are, we, are, we live in abundance, and we, we, we can share generously, then you start to change the culture of your parish. And then you can create social networks that share the community abundance where by word of mouth and small groups and small 
activities in ministries where they take this on. I hope and pray that every one of those three ministries that Margaret talked about in her parish will decide that from this year forward, no matter what else they do, yes, they may dance in FDF, but they're always going to have a charitable activity. Yes, they may have this basketball program, but they'll always undertake a charitable activity. Yes, they may do these, these other programs, but they'll always have a charitable activity. And these stories need to be told and these networks need to be created. You need to make a religious call to give. And then once again, you need to thank and celebrate. Now, I have summarized in this slide probably 20 or more different scientific studies on generosity, particularly charitable generosity. So I, I know it's a lot of information coming at you rapidly, but I wanted to just make sure you got the summary of all of this great data. We talk about having effective weapons. Now, I know that seems a little bit oxymoronic when you start to think about a stewardship thing. This whole notion of the battle is this kind of uh, metaphor that I'm trying to create in kind of a, in a humorous sense. So let's look at the weaponry that we have. So most of your weapons need to be completely redone. So let me just be, let's start with the obvious thing here because you, you're never going to win the battle with the weapons you have. Okay, so let's talk about it. So one of the first things I like to focus on is your stewardship card. The most important part of your stewardship card is the back part where you get people to sign up in ministries. I happen to have chosen one from one of the parishes that I'm a steward of. And so it took me forever to kind of get them to listen to me, but at least they, they kind of listen to me now. And so this is the, the stewardship card at the uh, cathedral here in Atlanta. And you'll notice that there are all the ministry opportunities that you can check the box to serve on. And by the way, this is electronic. You can go to that website and you can fill this out electronically. That's why there are little, little boxes over there, right? And they did a strategic plan and the parish did a strategic plan. And so if you look at the second column, those are um, uh, task forces of the strategic planning team that you can sign up to work on. So you can sign up on ministries, you can sign up on strategic plan, you can sign up on parish council committees, but they try to drive everybody into this thing to get you engaged in ministry because the data proves unequivocally, if you're engaged in ministry, the financial giving follows. Uh, this is uh, a, a flip side of, of a card that you can take a look at. And again, this is a, a trifold uh, brochure. This is one that's provided by the uh, Archdiocese and Father Jim's office over there. And so you can see in this trifold where there's a place for information, there's a little uh, reference to the scripture. There's the simple one line there, how much we're going to give each week. And then notice how they have taken a listing of the ministries there. Uh, this is available to you through the Archdiocese. You can custom in fact, you should customize it because your ministry list may be different and probably is different. But this is another resource that is available to you to show you the importance of this weapon. Uh, this is one uh, that I found from a Serbian Orthodox uh, church. That's the outside of the trifold. And here's the inside of the trifold. And again, notice how the emphasis and focus is on engaging you in ministries, engaging you in ministries, engaging you in ministries. And yeah, oh, by the way, there's one line in there for treasure, right? And, and so this is one of the key aspects of the weaponry that we're talking about because we know the data is unequivocally clear. It's a settled issue. When people are engaged in ministries of the church, their giving is significantly higher than if they're not engaged. Period. Full stop. End of conversation. This is not debatable, folks. So when people say, what can we do? to solve our financial stewardship problem. I said, stop thinking about it as a financial stewardship problem and start thinking about it as an engagement in ministry problem. And when you get people engaged in ministry, your financial problems go away. And, and the second weapon I wanna uh, prepare for you or make sure you're prepared for is the ministry handbook. This is the, the book that lists all of your ministries and describes those ministries and says who's running the ministry and how you can contact them. Now, if you go to my website and there's the link over there under there's, I have, a, I have these five ministry handbooks or these four and then a couple more, but these four ministry handbooks and a couple more available to you to download, to take a look at. You'll notice that the one in the upper left-hand corner is one from your metropolis. It's one that we worked at at St. Anthony's Parish in Pasadena quite a few years ago. And it's really one of the better uh, ones that we've, we've, actually, we've actually seen done uh, within the Orthodox ecosystem. On the opposite side and the right side is another beautiful one that came from uh, St. Nicholas uh, Church in Lexington, Massachusetts. Great ministry handbooks. Reason why this is an important tool is because this is what outlines what all of your ministries are and what they're doing, who the contact person is and how people can get in touch. Remember, we're trying to drive people into our ministries, okay? So these are some of the weaponry that you need to update. Uh, another piece of weaponry you need to update is your separate 
youth stewardship program. For most of you, this will be the first time you're going to have a youth stewardship program, but they need to have their entirely own youth stewardship program. They need to make their own individual pledge of time, talents, and their treasures. I mean, it's okay if it comes from their allowance or whatever the case may be, but I don't want Yai to keep giving in the money to put it in there. I want this to come from the sweat of their brow. You have to change the messaging depending on the demographics. So the messaging to the, think about it this way. You have preschool, you have middle, um, elementary school, middle school, and high school. That's kind of the four categories of messaging, right? So what you're asking each of those four constituencies to do in time, talents, and treasures is all a little different based on their age. And I'll give you an example in a second. You need to use understandable examples and messages. I've sat and listened to and watched a couple of homilies and stewardship messages to kids. You might as well have been trying to teach them Newtonian physics because there was no chance they were going to get the message because somebody's reciting a parable and they never bothered to explain bring that parable into today's understanding of it. So talking to a bunch of kids about sheep, mm, not going to connect folks. So they have to, you have to make it understandable. You have to tell the stories, but you have to connect it to what they'll understand, right? We also talk about sponsoring many different service opportunities. So notice in Margaret's example, and you're gonna hear some other ones where the idea here is to engage your youth in providing service of, of to the church and outside the church and to the community as a whole, because that's what inspires stewardship. Then you need to, and don't forget this step, send materials home for the parents to reinforce the message. In other words, when you, whatever your message is that you're talking about stewardship in your program, make sure you provided a one-page summary to the parents. This is what we talked about. This is what we want you to reinforce with the kids engaged in some conversation. And if you recall from the longer stewardship program, I, I used the reference of one of the big box churches here that I like what they did was they took that message and they put it on a little hang tag that you put on your rear view mirror of your car because they figured out that most times parents are shuttling their kids back and forth the countless number of different places and that was a good time for them to have that little hang tag with the three messages that they wanted to reinforce so that they can engage in dialogue with their kids and then finally you need to recognize and have the youth offer testimonials in church and in bulletins my brothers and sisters if you will get the young people to stand up in front of the congregation and tell the story of what they did with whatever resources whatever time whatever talents they did it will be the single most motivational thing you could possibly do it does doesn't matter who the most effective speaker you know, it doesn't matter, they will be dwarfed by seeing some of the kids from your community stand up and share this extraordinary story. This is an example of a youth stewardship card that I like. Um, unfortunately, it comes from, not unfortunately, it comes from a Roman Catholic church, so we borrow from wherever we find it, right? And the reason why I like this is notice how they focus their attention right away on time, talents, and treasures. And notice what this, it's it maybe hard for you to see in some of these cases, but notice what some of the time requirements are. The first one is attend mass every Sunday and on holy days. Now, we don't necessarily think of that as stewardship, but we ought to be thinking about that as stewardship, and they're teaching these kids that. Then later on, the third one down that list is spend 15 minutes a day in personal prayer. Notice how they're reinforcing multiple things. They're reinforcing prayer and using this as a catalyst to treat it as an act of stewardship, right? And then they have some talents down there, and then they have some treasure down there. Now, this is for kids of a certain age. The, this is for, I think, middle age, uh, middle school kids. The high school one actually allows them to do more activities that high school kids have the more uh, accessibility to do. And then the elementary, I mean, the, uh, the elementary school one is even more simplistic than this, right? Because there's not a whole lot that you can ask them to do. So take the stewardship form and make it age appropriate by elementary, middle, and high school, okay? Um, websites matter. Your church website needs to be completely redone. I mean, virtually every one of your church websites, I hope you'll scrap them and start over again. Uh, let me give you some data. 97% um, of people that do a search, do a search for church online. That's how they're looking for you. Okay. So don't think that that website is unimportant. Let me give you the next piece of data. In a test that was done by this group that's featured down at the bottom there, they, ass they assessed 1,008 church websites, and they found that 96.2% of them failed the first impression test. 
And the first impression test is five elements. Is there a focal point? Is there a responsive design? Is there a quick load time? Were there no stock photographs of people's faces? And was there an accessible new visitor information? 96% of them failed the first impression test on at least one of those five things. I would venture to say every one of your parish websites would fail that criteria. Let me give you a third piece of data. The feel of the website is the main driver in first impressions. In other words, 94% of the respondents said it was the design that captured them more than the content. Now, I'm not telling you the content is unimportant. What I'm telling you is they'll never get to your content if you don't capture their attention with the design and the elements of it, okay? A um, Couple other data points on here. One thing to remember is that 53% of all browsing right now is done on smartphones and tablets. If you don't test your website on your telephone and on your tablet, you will probably lose 50% of the viewing traffic that you can get on it. So that's the action you have to take. 80% of the people stop engaging if it loads in less than three seconds. Let me repeat that. 80% of the people, this is how completely impatient we are. Look, I'm ADHD. I come by it naturally. I don't know why this, the rest of you are in that category, right? But we're at the point now where 80% of people will stop engaging with a website if it loads in less than three seconds, if it loads in longer than three seconds. So you've got three seconds for it to load. I'm going to give you a piece of data that's going to show you don't have that much time anyway. Um, Third uh, data point, 62% of church websites don't easily provide new visitor information. I think the percentage in Orthodox churches is much higher. Um, every church before I work with them, I'll go to their website. And the first thing I look for is on the home page, can I see what is your address? What are your hours? What is your telephone number? Is there a place where I can click to figure out where you are? If that general information is not available, literally, you're not going to have the opportunity to gather people. And this is the data point that really scared the willies out of me, and I hope it will you. Users, this is from data, hard, reliable, empirical data, form an initial opinion of if they'll stay or leave a website in 50 milliseconds. That's 0 0.05 seconds. Instant impact. I'm going to give you an example and show you the difference of what that can look like. Um, what Features people say they look most for in church websites. Here are the top five. Okay, so again, I'm summarizing a lot of data for you in a very in a very quick fashion. They want to be able to listen and download the sermons. That's assuming the sermons are worthy of being downloaded and listened to. No, 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 no disrespect intended, right? So make sure that you are recording your sermons and you're making them available. They want to look for service opportunities at the church. They want to find service information in the church. They want to be able to forward the content that they find to others. And they want to be able to read information about visiting that parish. Okay. Now, this is not your, you know, so look at, look at it from this perspective. Look at your website and say, can I find how I could serve somebody in my church on my website? And I will tell you the vast majority of the ones I look at, heck, I'd be happy if they even listed their, their, their ministries, right? So there's a lot of work to be done. So I'm going to give you a quick little thing, something that you'll never unremember, okay? So sometimes a little picture gives you a graphic image. Church, the really best church websites, you, EWE, EWE, you'll remember you by that ridiculous picture of that you that's off to the right over there. But here's what that stands for. Educate, welcome, and engage educate, welcome, and engage. You need to provide information that is important about how do you come to us and what do we believe. It needs to be welcoming and accessible, and it needs to be engaging. People wanted, they got to immediately want to jump in and take a look at it. Now, I'm going to give you two examples of websites that I have discovered work to accomplish both of those. Your Eminence, please forgive me. I know you're going to get offended at me on the first one that I'm going to show, but I'm just going to give you an example of something that I know that really, really pops. So I'm going to flash it up on the screen, and I want you to take five milliseconds and form an immediate impression about whether this is a website you might want to spend a little bit of time clicking around. Now, if you notice this website, it, it accomplishes all of those objectives. Now, 
I didn't load it. This is an image from the home page, right? But it loads in, in nanoseconds. I mean, it's a quick load. It's a captivating picture. It's the kind of picture that gets you to kind of look down that road. And then if you look in the middle, it says learn more and you can click on it there. It's not overly busy. There's no stock photographs of people on there. There's immediate information about how you can, this is from our retreat center, our, ver our version of your ranch, uh, the, the Alcanea Retreat Center. And um, it, it accomplishes all the objectives. And, and I, and, and this is, again, a, a credit of stewardship, right? So I give credit to the young woman who designed and created the entire web page for the Aquanea Retreat Center, who is a recent college graduate. Um, she's a, a, a young adult uh, and happens to be starting you know, her own little uh, website business. I'm not promoting her website business. I'm just telling you that we approached her and said, hey, can you help us think through this? And she goes, how about if I offer it as an act of stewardship? And we said, thank God. So here's a time when we look at people and we say, I want you to give of the gifts that God has given you. And we didn't even have to say it. she understood it. She created this captivating website. I'll give you a second one from a parish. Again, regrettably, this is not one from your metropolis. I can't say that I looked at all of them, but I didn't find one. But this is from St. Athanasius Parish in, in the metropolis of Chicago. Look at how immediately captivating this website is. I mean, it makes an impression on you. It's like, wow. Now, I'm not saying this is perfect or anything like that. I'm just saying, notice the difference between this and what your website looks like. And if you actually clicked on the St. Athanasio site, you do it. And this is another example. In this case, he's not a young person. He's a he's a middle-aged guy who uh, who's, a, who's a professional in this space over here. And uh, and you know, when they said we really want to do something, he said, well, if you really want to do something, I'll show you how to do it right. And he volunteered and he completely re-engineered their website. And so Louis Lambert did a great job. And both of them would be available to talk to your people about what they did and how they did it. That's the reason why I provide you their information. Okay, let's talk um, about schedule and then we'll end with execution. Campaigns. A stewardship campaign is not a one-day activity. It's not a one-week activity. It's not a one-month activity. It is a full year activity. And it is an annual year long activity. I'm actually going to give you a calendar, a suggested calendar of what that looks like. There should be monthly and I repeat no less frequently than monthly stewardship articles in all parish publications. If you have a brochure, I mean, a, um, a bulletin, if you have a newsletter, you send out, if you have a magazine, if you have an online, I don't care where it is, you need to have a monthly stewardship article about it, not the long winded diatribe. If you want to use scripture, that's perfect, but apply it in the context. Give it a testimonial to it. Talk about how it was applied and made a difference. It has to be at least monthly. That's part of the exercise. And then at least quarterly stewardship presentations. I'm going to give you an example in the proposed timeline. Mix it up between clergy and laity. Mix it up between old lady and young lady. I'll give you an example in a second. Focus on the life-changing ministries, not the problems. Remember, people give to mission and vision. Emphasize time and talents and ministry engagement. We know that's the secret to getting people to give more is to get more engaged. Explain your online giving uh, effectiveness. And then the last two that go hand in glove. You heard Margaret talk about it. You need to become a percentage giving parish on your way to being a tithing parish. You have to be a percentage giving your parish on a way to becoming a tithing parish, which means you have to start talking about percentage giving. And the roundup is the easiest way to do it. It's where you give, you, you calculate what percentage of your income you gave last year to the church out to one decimal point and then round up to the next highest whole number. So if you gave 0.8% of your income last year to the church, this year make it 1%. If you gave 1.4%, this year make it 2%. If you gave 2.6 this year, make it 3%. That's it. Just round up to the next highest whole number. And if at the end of the year, you could still eat and feed your family and take care of what you need, then the next year, add one more percent to it. And you keep adding 1% until you get to the 10% tithing threshold. Simple, easy way parishes. You heard Margaret's example of it. I will tell you that a big part of the reason why they made such great strides in that regard is because of the messaging that they used in making it simple. Um, you have to have a specific stewardship campaign month. And I'm gonna show you that in an example. Again, in the perfect world, post-COVID, we'll have either personal in-home visits or group gatherings. We're gonna hand deliver stewardship packets. We're not gonna mail them, we're gonna hand deliver them. Uh, the greatest uh, fundraising expert I ever worked with told me the only brochure that matters or only solicitation that matters is one that has a thumbprint and an index fingerprint times two on it. It means it has your fingerprint and thumbprint 
and handing it to somebody else who put their fingerprint and thumbprint on it. In other words, it has to be personal. You have to conduct a separate youth campaign. You have to focus on ministry information and recruitment. We recommend holding a ministry fair because there's no better way to engage people in it. I'll show you where that fits in the timeline. And then personal follow-up to reach 100% participation and then always celebrate success. Let me give you a calendar. Now, this is just a sample calendar. Feel free to use it, change it, modify it, whatever you want to, but this will give you a projected layout of what the whole year would look like. Notice at the very beginning, it says monthly stewardship articles and stories every month. That doesn't matter what else is going on. That's gonna happen. In January, you can start by recruiting your team and the priest gives the first stewardship homily. I mean, what greater time to actually give a stewardship homily? Again, not a we need more money homily, but a money about uh, I, uh, money, a homily about sharing the gifts God has given us as we reflect on the, the, the coming year and the things that we want to accomplish. In February is when I suggest you introduce your first adult lay testimonial. Yes, Father will give us homily, but at the end of church, before the dismissal, have an adults come up and talk about either one of the ministries that they're engaged in that's making a difference in the kingdom and, and how it's making a difference or how they felt about serving in that ministry, a first person testimonial. In March, this is where you have a life-changing ministry presentation. Again, a ministry comes forward and says, look at what we've done, look at what we've accomplished with your generosity, with your support, this is the difference we made in the kingdom. Reminding people of their why every step of the way. In April, a perfect time for the second stewardship homily. Now, usually April is going to overlap with, with the Lenten season, so there's plenty of great content that, that one can use in that point. In May, I would introduce a youth testimonial. Again, it's a good time because this is when a lot of the high school kids are graduating from high school and they're reflecting on their future going forward. So it's a good time to get one of those high school students to stand up and tell a story about stewardship and what it means to be a steward and how important it is to them. Whatever they want to talk about is fine. If they want to talk about stewardship of the environment, that's great. If they want to talk about stewardship of taking care of Yaya, that's fine. It doesn't matter. The point is we want to get them up there sharing their story. June is when you spend the time preparing your materials, your stewardship commitment form, your stewardship up, you have to update that stewardship uh, brochure that I talked about because you'll have some changes in ministries and some maybe some changes in leaders. So you need to update your materials. In July is when you have your third stewardship homily. There's a lot of great things happening in July and it's a good time to kind of reinforce that messaging. In August, I recommend having your young adult, a second young adult testimonial come up in there. Um, and again, this is a good time because now they're coming back into the school season so they can reflect on what it looks like. Maybe it's a kid that's going off to college or maybe it's somebody that's going on to school. This is also a good time to hold your ministry fair. Um, people are coming back from their month long vacations in Greece or wherever they're going to nowadays, right? And, and it's a good time to get your ministries in front of everybody in the, in the August or early September time frame. September is a, is when you start a, a this is a suggestion. You can feel free to change it any way you want to, but it's a good time to start your adult and youth campaigns and your personal visits. You take the entire month to touch every soul in your community, both adults and youth with personal visits. Again, in the youth campaign, it's typically done through the Sunday school where there's easy contact. In October is when you do your follow-up calls and your follow-up work so you reach 100%, no steward left behind. So all the month of September, and that's constant messaging and follow-up and activities and meeting with people, et cetera, the events that we talked about in that nine-part program. November is when you have your fourth stewardship homily, and it's when you report your results. By then you will have two months to have generated your results and you're gonna have a great story to tell as we enter into the Thanksgiving season, which leads us to December where there's no better time than to thank and celebrate, thank and celebrate, thank and celebrate. And the beautiful thing about this process is you can change any one of these around. The elements are all there. The sequence works, but if you want to change it, by all means, do it. If you slip one, that's okay. And But the idea is every year you're going to be repeating this process, not using the same people, not using the same messages, not using the same things until you've created a culture of stewardship in your parish to where everybody in the parish can get up and give their own testimonial. Um, I've provided you, as I said, resources of sample 
articles that you can feel free to plagiarize all you want to. I don't need any credit. There's just some articles that I wrote that you that you can use to try and, and spur some motivation. It works better if it comes from people within your community, but sometimes you can intersperse it with, with uh, context. And if you look down below there, you'll see the Stewardship Ministry Handbooks is where you can download the examples of the handbooks uh, that I provided you as examples. So as we kind of wrap up my part, I wanted you to, let's talk a little bit about old, old Albert here, Uncle Albert, right? He said something I think that was really challenging that we sometimes skip over. He said, the world as we have created it is a process of our thinking. And it can't be changed without changing our thinking. Just let that sit, settle in for you for a second, right? The process you created in stewardship, the culture you created in your parish, the, the ministry materials you created were a process of your thinking. If you want a different result, you have to change your thinking. And so what we're trying to do here is to get you to think about changing the culture that you've created in this regard. And that kind of leads to the last thing about execution. And of course, we have to have some Greek philosophy in here. Uh, Aristotle, who once wisely said that we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence is not an act, but a habit. The first time you do something well, congratulations. That's one. The second time, it could be an accident, by the way. It certainly has been that way in my life sometimes when all of a sudden I've done something, I look at, well, that worked out well, but that's not what I thought it was going to be, right? Um, the second time you do it, you're starting to build some muscle, but it is through that repeated activity that we create what excellence really is when it becomes a habitual behavior. And that's what we're trying to communicate with you, that if stewardship is going to be a cultural phenomenon in your parish, you have to, you must recognize this is going to require repetition and it's going to require continued execution of excellence behind it. But in that, you should always embrace creativity because creativity is what's going to drive you into think of new things and new ways to communicate it and new ministries and new activities. Again, we're not changing the liturgy. We're not changing the sacraments. We're changing the whole operational way in which we engage with our church. And so that we got to come back to the smart German guy who, who once said that logic will get you from A to B, but imagination will take you everywhere, which led him to conclude, the smart guy said that imagination is more important than knowledge. And so I want to encourage you as you start to envision what the stewardship ministry at your parish could look like, don't take anything I've said or Steve said or Father Jim said or as Eminent said or Kristen said as being the same gospel that came down or the same rules of the Ten Commandments that came down from the mountain, right? They are guides. They're based on research. They're based on best practices. But use your imagination. Think of how this will work in your parish because ultimately one day you will stand before the awesome judgment seat of Christ. And his eminence won't be there to defend you. And I won't be there to defend you. And Steve won't and Kristen, none of, us, Father Jim, none of us will be there to defend you. I don't think. So you've got to create that good account before the awesome judgment seat of Christ. And that's what stewardship is all about. All right, quick word. As I mentioned before, this entire deck is available to you to download on my website. Go to the stewardship tab. Scroll down to the Metropolis of San Francisco program. The entire five-part program that we delivered um, earlier is there also, but this one is the one on the top and you can actually download it. Um, if you have any ideas for the uh, monthly program that we do on Stewardship Calling on Ancient Faith Radio, by all means, shoot me an email. I'll be happy to cover it. I'm real excited about what's coming next. It's only uh, peripherally related to stewardship. So allow me a shameless promotion of something. One of the things that I've discovered in over 15 years of working with churches now is we don't handle conflict well, and we don't know how to deal with difficult conversations. I mean, that's just something, and I looked everywhere and I couldn't find good Orthodox resources. So instead I went out and found a great Orthodox resource. And as it turns out, we have a professor. He doesn't, he's not attached to a university. He's got his own consulting firm who has his PhD and he's actually an expert in this thing. It has the, one of the best classes in how to have difficult conversations and how to deal with uh, um, uh, conflict within the church world. So I'm going to do a two-part program with Dr. Mitch Owen. Um, he resides at a Greek Orthodox church in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, uh, although he's Antiochian by background, he has to keep reminding me he's Lebanese, but anyway, we got him. Uh, so Dr. Mitch and I are going to do a two-part program. Uh, this first Wednesday is April 7th, and then the next month, Wednesday, is part two, uh, is going to be on having difficult conversations in church and how to deal with conflict in church. And again, we're going to be getting a lot of free advice from him uh, available. Anything else that we can do for you, either through my ministry, Stewardship Calling, or the other, other ministry I'm affiliated with, Orthodox Ministry Services, that information is available to you. Reach out to me and do it. Last
last thing I wanted to, to cover before we get to the Q&A is if we're going to truly think of stewardship as a battle, which we shouldn't, it's one of the most joyous races we run, but using that kind of funny metaphor of the Trojan horse, we have to create a worthy vision for what I, why our parish exists. We have to build a team of people over time that can achieve what we want to accomplish through a winning strategy, proven tactics, persuasive communications, using effective weapons. We are working on an achievable schedule with dedicated rep repetitive execution. And that's all I have. We have a couple of other presentations and then Q&A. So I'll stop to share and Steve, you take it from here. Bill, thank you very much. Um, qu quick question, Bill. I did check your stewardship calling site. The presentation's not posted yet, correct? It's there. Hmm. Well, let me, let me, let me, let me I'll check. Take a look. Uh, yeah. I was missing it. Um, I'm seeing I saw something. It. It's there. What's it's that? There. I saw it. It's there. It was right so at we, the very top. So we would call it operator error, huh? All right. So let me just show you. Okay, we love you, Steve. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I know. Okay, so, yeah, yeah, no, that's okay. No, here's, here's, let me just do a quick little share if I could, and I'll show you where it is. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So this is hopefully, no, is that, are you seeing my website? Yes. Okay. So if you look here, it's right underneath the general description. It, it's the very first thing that's there. Uh, you know okay. what? Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's then the, blind. yeah, blind. Yeah, well, look, and I'm doing it myself, and so I apologize. <laughs> it's not very well. It's not yeah. my just I, a little a fun point. And one of the guys who designed the websites that I showed you says I shouldn't say this, but I do this to make the point. Please don't look as my website as meeting any of the criterion of an effective church website. It does not, because I'm my own webmaster. It stinks. In fact, he's actually said he's going to take my website, and before I know it, he's going to make it be functionally accurate. But I keep saying, I'm not selling anything. I'm giving it away. You know, it doesn't matter. And he keeps saying, but you're not doing your church, you know, people very much service. So it's there. Thank you for that clarification. I did, no did miss that. Um, Bill, thank you. Uh, we do. I know we, we've been trying to keep these to eight o'clock uh, to respect everyone's time, at least eight o'clock Pacific, knowing we have multiple time zones. But we did ask if you can stay on just a, a little bit longer because uh, Bill referred to story, the stories that we hear, and, and I've got to share that listening to the stories and some of the great work that's being done at the parishes, for me, is truly inspirational also. And um, besides Holy Transfiguration up in Anchorage, um, we have Mark who uh, from St. Paul's Irvine, who would like to share a little bit about the, just a, a little bit about this, the uh, St. Paul's story, because there's so much incredible work being done there by the lay leadership, by Father Stephen, uh, by Mark. Um, so Mark's going to talk a little bit about St. Paul's in Irvine, and then uh, Sandy's going to uh, talk about Phoenix and uh, Holy Trinity and Phoenix and some of the things that, you know, as a relatively new stewardship chair, <clears throat> has, um, has really kind of got, got rolling there um, at a very significant parish in Phoenix. So Mark, if we can have you spend just a few minutes and sharing some of that, the experiences, and if there's some questions from the group, please feel free to ask Mark or any of us questions. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, okay. Thanks, uh, Steve. Uh, Bill, I enjoyed your presentation. Uh, your eminence, thank you uh, for your earlier comments. Um, and I'll try to keep this brief. Um, you know, at St. Paul's, I feel incredibly blessed to be a part of uh, such a wonderful community. We're led by Father Steve is just a, an amazing um, kind of spiritual leader of the church. And it, it, it really comes down to the why uh, that Bill mentioned. I mean, I think the why is so important. And, and, and the why to us, I think, drives our stewardship campaign to its, to its very fiber. And that is, I mean, we are all committed to creating kind of an orthodox christian island of faith and and education and community and outreach kind of in a in a sea of secular strife and distortion and and distraction it's it's that community that we hit home every time we talk about stewardship that you are supporting this blessed community and and Christ's message lives within this community. 
and, and it's facilitated by these things, these educational aspects, these opportunities for Bible study, these uh, men's fellowship, these outreach programs. And in every communication, we, we thank the parish. We, and, and frankly, I, I am so humbled uh, by the by the members of, of my parish community, uh, in addition to to the clergy, uh, because they are uh, in a very engaged parish, um, and and it makes my job as the stewardship chair uh, a relatively easy one in a sense. Uh, but but this idea of and I don't you know using kind of a, a, a work term hammering this theme that that stewardship is part of your christian journey it's time it's talent it's engagement it's the hard work of of following the words and teaching of the lord and savior but in in all the time you have you are also given the gifts that that you've been provided and giving those back in 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 the, the measure to which you can is actually a ministry and 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 i come from a protestant background of tithing and 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 so to me i'm i'm constantly echoing this theme of tithing being part of my christian journey it's it's how i fund and support this beautiful community and 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 so we go through a process a schedule uh it's it's not as as elegant or as detailed as bill described but we have a a formal stewardship sunday uh, right around Thanksgiving, we lead up to that with uh, after uh, liturgy uh, uh, kind of speakers uh, at the pulpit. Uh, I will do it twice a year. Uh, I have four stewardship members, one of them at least or another, uh, sometimes two will do it. We'll usually pull in a speaker during the year uh, from one of the ministries. Uh, Bill's idea of having um, the the greeting committee on the stewardship is one that, that I think is just a terrific idea. I hadn't thought of it, uh, and I know it's, it was in the materials before, and it just occurred to me when you were talking that would be great because we have a, a terrific outreach uh, or a greeting community uh, or committee. But it is a year-long process. The emphasis is in the fourth quarter. Um, we we tend to dial back our activity during Lent. Uh, and that's it, it, to kind of focus on 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 our Lenten journey, um, but you know it, it's a process that takes place throughout the year. You know we have 400 uh, uh, contributing families uh, to the parish. Um, I have found that personal visits is is very difficult. Um, what we do is we'll send a letter, and we have we'll have two or three versions of the letter. Uh, separated by demographics that we uh, that we define. Um, each letter has similar themes, but they're they're specifically targeted um, uh, to that demographic. Um, and then we follow up uh, with a letter, and then based on a, a a data analysis of people that that will pledge for the following year, that's when we'll start to make outreach uh, uh, gestures. Uh, it's just it, it's just a matter of numbers. I can't do 400 people. Four people can't do 100 people in a month uh, if we were to try to reach out to everyone in the, the fourth quarter uh, of each year. Uh, so it's the residuals that pledged in the past. They're new, new people to the parish. Those are the people that we really focus on for, you know, we start with phones, uh, uh, try to set up a time. If that's not, uh, if that doesn't work, then we'll do our best to, um, you know, to spend some time on the phone with them. Uh, it is a commuter parish, so it is, you know, there is a bit of driving uh, for a lot of the parishioners. Uh, so getting together is, is, is a bit of a challenge outside the church. And it goes to Bill's point about engagement. One of the best things we've done is uh, Father Steve uh, does an Orthodoxy 101 uh, uh, kind of educational session every year. Um, and we'll have a session in there on stewardship. Uh, 
and and we'll also reach out to the, the bigger ministries and talk to them about stewardship and how we can uh, get involved in their ministry and 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 in kind of incorporate uh, the the stewardship message within uh, those those sub uh, ministries. The last thing I would say, the one thing we're we're lacking in, we've done it a little bit, but we 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 really need to spend some time on it. Is the youth ministry? I think that is an absolutely um, critical idea, a great area for development of our parish. I will tell you one of the, the issues that, that I think maybe all parishes face, but our parish in particular, we have a demographic issue. Um, the founders are aging. Uh, they're, they're well past their, their peak earning periods. The younger people are coming up. Uh, in many cases, it doesn't appear like they'll have the same kind of earning uh, power uh, as the founding members of the parish. And, and so we're having to, to do different things uh, to get, uh, you know, to keep uh, the, the annual stewardship budget or the annual stewardship uh, kind of yield uh, where it's at. And, and, and I think the youth, the youth uh, is, is the key uh, to that. And again, I, I say that uh, fully no, uh, knowing that I haven't done a, a good enough job of that. Um, I will just close in saying that, uh, again, um, one of the things that we lean on is our parish office. We have a terrific staff in the office, and uh, they have been invaluable uh, in, in helping us get the message out, target the message, uh, and, and keep both the why and also the thanksgiving uh, for all that the parish does uh, you know, kind of going and echoing uh, back and forth throughout the year. So if, if you have any questions, I can answer them. I'd be happy to. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Are there any questions for Mark? I know we have Sandy presenting too. And then if there are any um, questions either for Mark or Sandy, that would be, it would be great. Um, thank you, Mark. I mean, fantastic. I know that St. Paul's is always, um, very much a leader uh, across uh, our parishes. I know it's... Um... David, I have a question for Mark. Yep. Hi, Mark. Uh, my name is Bill Belko, uh, St. Constantine Helen Greek Orthodox Church in uh, Cardiff-by-the-Sea. And we have one, two, three, at one time, four members uh, in attendance tonight. And Linda Conellis is the, in charge of our stewardship program. And uh, two questions. What is your last name? And may you share your email with me because we are neighbors and perhaps we can get in closer communication. Uh, sure. My, uh, my last name is Hudoff. Uh, my first name is Mark Hudoff, H-U-D-O-F as in Frank F. And um, my email is um, Hudoff at sign S-B-C global dot net so that sam bravo charlie the world global and then any uh, dot net so shoot off at would you SBC be kind global of one more time please slower yeah uh shoot off h-u-d-o-f-f -F -F, at sign s-b-c global dot net so Mark, if you're comfortable too, you can always put it in the chat. Oh, yeah. uh, actually, okay. Kristen beat us to the punch. So, uh, and Mark, <laughs> and Mark, please give us your social security number, your bank account number, <laughs> and, your, and your mother's maiden name, because I think we could all use a little bit of a pay raise here. <laughs> so Mark, thank you. Uh, Sandy, I know we're running late, but uh, I want to talk a little bit about Phoenix and all the great work being done there at Holy Trinity. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I actually have been stewardship chair since 2017, but um, I really kind of like probably a lot of you, a lot of us were, was kind of going it alone for several years. I think I started a stewardship chair as a parish council member. There wasn't one for a while. And when I got on the parish council, I knew that that needed to be something that I need, I wanted to fix. So I kind of did it on my own for the first several years. I did just the very basic and the minimum, I didn't know better and I didn't know where else to go for information. So I really just kind of sent out the stewardship pledge card once a year and put the letter and I would write articles every month in the in the monthly newsletter, that sort of thing. We did the stewardship and I would report at the parish council or at the uh, parish assembly meetings, our, our numbers. And that was really kind of about it. And 
Um, I, I, I started growing from there. And, but then when truly um, I started to rethink things on, on, on stewardship a little bit, a couple years ago, but then it was really these, these seminars and um, especially um, the five part series led by Bill. But even before that, the ones that the metropolis started doing really kind of opened my eyes and, and made me realize that there were, there was a lot more out there. And so I knew I needed to revamp things and I knew I wanted, I had a lot to learn. And I feel like right now I'm still in that sponge um, uh, place where I'm still absorbing. So what we did was I put together a whole team of people and um, we kind of said we were gonna look at ev absolutely everything and change totally our mindset and what we were doing and how we were doing it and why we were doing it. So um, I did read the, um, I read the um, Maximize book, which was fascinating. Took a bunch of notes, sent all those, wrote them all up, sent it to our whole team. And then I read the Growing and Engaged Church book um, wrote up the notes on that, sent it out to everybody on, on our team, including our, our pastors. We meet um, now weekly um, via Zoom, our group, including our two pastors. So there's seven of us on the team, which is five lay, lay people and our two priests. And we have developed an entire program, um, really a, a brand new campaign. And we, we gathered the information from all of the, we gathered that campaign from all of the information that we gathered, the five part series, information I learned from the books. And then we held meetings with all of our ministry leaders and our parish council, and we gathered their information. And we found three overarching themes that kind of came from, from gathering all that information. We came away with three overarching themes, which were communication, engagement, and outreach. And so everything we do now falls into one of those three categories, communication. And, and what we are doing right now is kind of a getting our house in order. We've kind of used a little bit of, of this pandemic and looked at it as kind of a blessing in disguise that, you know, a little bit of downtime or kind of away from the normalcy is given us an opportunity to kind of get some things done that really needed to be done. We have revamped all of our communications um, the look of them, the layout, we've made them more professional, concise, and we're doing a better job on our messaging. It's very positive um, and encouraging. We are, um, so social media, our um, stewardship statements, we're redoing our stewardship statements. It would look like um, we are working on a calling campaign um, right now that we are putting together. So we will, every parishioner will receive a minimum of two to three phone calls per year. We are going to get to um, uh, small groups, but we're obviously with the pandemic, we're not ready to do that in Arizona. We're not in the South, Bill, so we can't quite do that yet here, but we're, get, we're gonna get there. It's, it's on our short list for sure. Um, so our communications is a whole new thing. Everything we're doing, how we're communicating with our parishioners and the way we're communicating is, is going to be completely different. Our engagement, we are totally revamping our entire Sunday school program. Um, looking at it entirely different where we've, we're purchasing a new, um, a new curriculum, engaging all new people and um, working to completely improve that. Working with our um, current ministries, that will be, of course, small groups and adding new ministries as needed. Our outreach is um, touches on community outreach opportunities for our parishioners to come together. And we started doing this a couple years ago. And so we're kind of continuing that, but we have um, two to three, maybe four, depending on the year, um, community-wide outreach programs that we do as a parish together, kind of to bring our, our parish together. Um, for right now during Lent, we are collecting food for one of our um, most prominent food banks in, in the city of Phoenix that has been very hard hit by the pandemic. And so we're collecting um, money as well as canned food or, or our non-perishables for them. Um, that's happening right in our narthex as people come to church that are putting them in these boxes at the end of the um, it, it will go all the way up through Pasca. And at that point, we will report back to our community how much food we donated and how much money we donated to them as well. So we do report back to our community. The last one we did 
um, last summer or was it last Easter, I believe we did Project Mexico. And we sent an entire truckload of um, goods down to Project Mexico. So our outreach program has really, I think one of those things, it's really brought our community together and made us think outside of our, of our four walls. So we look at um, larger things within our, within our parish, within our own backyard, so local charities, but we're also looking at things within our, um, our diocese. We do have something coming up um, also in a couple of weeks with OCMC, we're doing a Zoom presentation for all of our parishioners to learn more about OCMC. Um, and we are going to be reaching out to people within a five mile radius of our church that we are going to do um, uh, kind of a direct marketing campaign, inviting them to come to our festival, inviting them to come to a church service or even just a coffee hour after church. And we are also going to um, provide, uh, providing that we can have our festival in October um, our plan is to completely revamp our festival church tours and make them an opportunity, a better opportunity. Our church tours are actually really well done, but what we don't do is take that, they could be better, but what we don't do and that we're going to change is capture, do a better job of capturing people who come into our, our church for those church tours um, make sure that we collect their information and that we follow up with a thank you for, for attending as well as a little gift. Um, not sure what that will be, but it will be something that we mail to them as a thank you and then invite them to come visit us for, for a church service or something like that down the road. Um, so that's kind of our overall program that we're looking at doing. One of the things that we are doing as far as our youth program, this is still a work in progress, but this was the idea that we kind of came up with. It's something really different, but um, we haven't really done a youth stewardship program in a very long time. And so one of the things I thought would be fun and engaging and that would kind of um, hopefully get some excitement and uh, our stewardship or team and um, our Sunday school team kind of like the idea is that we will present our steward, our Sunday school kids with maybe three options, charity options, maybe one local, um, one national, maybe one, you know, in our archdiocese. Um, and on a given Sunday, they will vote. All the Sunday school kids will vote and they will collectively choose which, which uh, charity they would like to support throughout the year. Um, and whether it be Project Mexico, have, you know, or St. Mary's Food Bank, whichever it might be. Um, throughout the course of the year, we will develop a program where they are either bringing in some of their own money to donate to those things. In addition to that, we want to create some opportunities for Sunday school kids to work together to raise some money. Um, at the end of the year, we'll, you know, tally up all that money, make the donation. But I also thought what we, what we may end up doing, we haven't presented this to our parish council yet, but that our parish council will match dollar for dollar. Um, those funds that the kids raise. And um, so that there's a little more incentive for the kids to kind of do that. So it's, it's teaching the kids to um, hopefully come together as a group, work together for the greater good and do something outside of our four walls again so for a charity um, down the road. So it's not necessarily stewardship for our own church, but it's something that gets, gets the kids involved in thinking. So that's kind of what we're planning to do, we will see that's not set in stone. Um, but we are about 300 families at Holy Trinity Cathedral. Um, and we did not have a festival this past year. We're planning to have one in the fall. Our goal, of course, we would love for our festival to not pay 50% of our bills. Um, rather, we would love for that money to go to capital contributions and things that around the church that need to be done. And we are hoping that through better communication, stronger communications, better engagement and community outreach that like Bill has said, we won't need to ask people to raise the money to increase their stewardship. It will just happen naturally. So um, we did do this past year for the first time, we did do a roundup ask um, for, our, for our 2021 campaign. We asked P, there were two goals for our 2021 campaign. The two goals were number one, to uh, round up your stewardship over your 2020 um, contributions. And number two, we asked that people fill out, turn in 
your ple their pledge card and make a contribution towards their pledge card no later than January 31st. Uh, I don't know if other churches are this way. We still have people filling out their 2021 pledge cards. We get a lot of those pledge cards turned in around Easter time. We get even more, uh, and then it kind of dies off. And then we get another big influx in August, September when you know dance practice starts again, Sunday school starts again. People go, oh yeah, never did fill out my pledge card. So if 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 we can teach people and slowly encourage them to be regular givers from the beginning of the year through the end of the year. Um, it becomes, you know, part of their practice. So um, that was our first ask for our 2021 campaign. We will continue to be a rounding up parish on our way to a tithing parish. So we are a work in progress is kind of how I look at it. We are also engaging with Bill on starting this Saturday morning. We are starting the Y discovery process with Bill. And we are going to be using our findings from this Y discovery process to come up with our why statement. And that will be, we will share that with our parish and it will be something that we will use in all of our literature and all of our communications moving forward. And I think that will also help bring our community together in a way that they can use that why statement too, because it applies to all of us. And if we're all on the same page, working for the same goal, it continues to engage and unite us as a parish. So um, I think that's about it for me, unless anybody has any questions. Um, I had a question for Sandy. I was just wondering, what are your um, recruitment techniques? You said you had assembled, well, you said you had assembled, uh, you had added people to your stewardship team. So I really did add, I, I liked what they did in, in um, and what Margaret did in, um, in Alaska that she added different um, age demographics. And I, I really think that's a good idea. And I think I'm gonna steal that, that idea from her. But we, we have a little bit of that, but for the most part, um, what I looked at is people who are regular church attenders, very involved and engaged parishioners and people who are active um, participants in stewardship and that are, that I know give sacrificially. And I'm not saying I know because I looked up their stewardship. <laughs> I know because I can see, I think we all know who those dedicated active stewards are that truly put into practice what stewardship means. And also people, to be honest with you, people that I know would do the work um, people that I know would put the time in because I think, and I have had worked with people, I've worked on a million committees in our church. I have been extremely involved in Holy Trinity my entire life. I've been on every committee, run every organization, you name it, I've done it. And I've worked with people that you can't count on. I needed people that I knew I could count on and get the job done and follow through. That was a huge thing too. So it kind of needed to be both. Not that would just talk the talk, but would walk the walk too. So. And then we are also working very closely, I should say, with our, with our parish council. Our parish council meets weekly right now, and we are working very hand in glove with our parish council um, too, because what we're doing is really overarching in the sense that, you know, when I talk about like, like Sunday school, we're helping with revamping our entire Sunday school program. That's not something that necessarily would be considered maybe stewardship, but we're looking at everything. Nothing's off the table as far as our committee is concerned. So. Fantastic. Sandy, uh, the dialogue is, is, is great. And it's exactly what we want. Um, unfortunately we were, I know, kind of pushing it late for, for Bill on the East Coast, for Father Caderas. Hang on to those topics, hang on to those questions. Um, on an upcoming session, we'll leave more time because this is exactly the type of sharing and dialogue we want to be having. So what we'll try to do is, is you know, again, maybe we'll have a shorter presentation and, and open it up, or maybe we'll start with this dialogue. So let's keep it going. I certainly, again, don't mean to I want, I want to encourage it more than anything, but we, I know the Metropolitan's got a busy night ahead. Many others do too. Um, so if we can, uh, Bill, any closing comments and then um, we'll come back together, um, everyone. And again, I, I'll commit to, um, we'll have Sandy, you know, back on because what you're doing is phenomenal, you know, from, and, I, and I'm sorry, you know, realizing you're in your fourth year, 
besides sending out the uh, the brochures and the cards, it, now you're revamping the entire parish, which is which is pretty awesome. Um, so so thank you, Sandy. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Bill, any closing comments? Let's see, I'm mute. No, I'm just I, I'm oh. just I'm my heart's full listening to everything y'all are doing. It's just beautiful. Thank God. Glory to God. All glory to God. Good. Well, we look forward to talking more and sharing more amongst one another. Your Eminence, if you please. Many, many thanks to all, to uh, Brother Bill Marianis, to Sandy, to Mark, and to Margaret for sharing with us a wonderful uh, experiences of the stewardship. Let us pray that uh, our God will give us inspiration to do his work thusly. Christ our God, who are at all times and in every hour in heaven and on earth, you are worshipped and glorified, who are long-suffering, merciful and compassionate, who loves the just and shows mercy upon the sinner, who calls all to salvation through the promise of blessings to come. Lord, at this hour receive our supplications and direct our lives according to your commandments, sanctify our souls, hallow our bodies, correct our thoughts, cleanse our minds, Deliver us from all tribulation, evil and distress. Encompass us with your holy angels, that guided and guarded by them, we may attain the unity of the faith and the knowledge of your unapproachable glory, for you are blessed to the ages of ages. Amen. A beautiful and most blessed and fruitful remainder of the great land, my brothers and sisters. Father Dimitrios, thank you so much for staying up late. Make sure that you... Say hello to Callie for me. Excellent. Thank you. Steve, thank you so much. God bless you all. Thank you for joining us, Your Eminence. Good night. May God bless you all.